In a previous video, I discussed the evidence-based cause of ulcerative colitis, which the data indicates is excess hydrogen peroxide emanating from colonic epithelial cells. This answers the question of how ulcerative colitis develops, but does not provide any answers regarding why people develop ulcerative colitis in the first place, or what causes relapse, and how can we cure this disease. So, in this video, we will answer the following questions to fill in the gaps. 1. What causes ulcerative colitis? 2. What is the evidence? 3. What are the environmental factors whose exposure increases the risk of developing ulcerative colitis? 4. What is the genetic predisposition that causes some people to develop ulcerative colitis? 5. What causes relapse? 6. What is the correct evidence-based treatment? And 7. What is the molecular basis of a cure? In other words, what needs to be done to cure this disease and how can we do this? Numbers 1 to 5 constitute the elements of the pathogenesis, or how ulcerative colitis develops. Number 6 discusses the most effective treatment based on the evidence. And number seven provides the molecular basis and therapeutic goals for effectuating a cure. The next slide will answer the question, what exactly is ulcerative colitis? So you have a better idea of what we will be talking about in the remainder of this video. All the references for this video are listed in the comments section below. Any questions can be posted in the comments section. This is a lot to do in one video, so let's get started. Before we can explain what the evidence indicates is the cause of ulcerative colitis, the first question we need to answer is, what is ulcerative colitis? Ulcerative colitis is an inflammatory bowel disease, which means that large numbers of white blood cells called neutrophils have moved into the colon or large intestine, where they release chemicals causing tissue damage and inflammation. We should not confuse ulcerative colitis with another inflammatory bowel disease called Crohn's disease, which is very different. Ulcerative colitis is the most common inflammatory bowel disease, affecting between one to two million Americans and millions more worldwide. Ulcerative colitis causes inflammation of the large intestine and mainly strikes individuals who are in the prime of life, in their teens to young adulthood. Ulcerative colitis causes bouts of abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea, with multiple daily bowel movements that can be sudden, unexpected, and explosive. These unexpected bouts, which are called relapse of disease or flares, can last weeks to months and are accompanied by significant emotional and psychological trauma, both for the patients and their entire family. There is currently no effective long-lasting treatment or cure, and 30% of people with ulcerative colitis eventually become refractory to all medical therapy and must undergo a life-saving total colectomy or surgical removal of their large intestine, which ushers in a whole new set of problems associated with life without a large intestine. Thus, there is a critical need for a new therapy that can address the underlying causal process leading to the development of this disease and provide long-lasting resolution of inflammation while restoring normal colonic functionality. In the next slide, we begin to explain what the evidence indicates is the cause of ulcerative colitis, the appropriate method of treatment, and how we can cure this disease. Understanding the cause of ulcerative colitis is very simple. The data indicate that ulcerative colitis is caused by hydrogen peroxide that leaks out of the epithelial cells that line the inner surface of the colon. On the left side of the diagram in section A 
it shows the entire colon inside the abdominal cavity highlighted by the red square. In panel B to the right, we have magnified a small piece of the cells lining the inner surface of the colon. The colonic epithelium are the cells highlighted by the red square. These are the cells that produce the excess hydrogen peroxide, which the data indicate causes ulcerative colitis. When hydrogen peroxide leaks out of the colonic epithelial cells, it attracts white blood cells into the colonic epithelium, causing inflammation and ulcerative colitis. We will go into this in more detail in the treatment section. I've added this description in the paragraph you now see on the screen in case you want to pause the video and go over it again. Now that you have an idea of where the hydrogen peroxide is coming from, we can examine what is so special about hydrogen peroxide that it can cause ulcerative colitis. Hydrogen peroxide is produced in every cell in the body, including colonic epithelial cells. But of all the thousands of different molecules in the human body, why would hydrogen peroxide cause ulcerative colitis? In other words, why is hydrogen peroxide so special? The answer is that hydrogen peroxide has several unique molecular characteristics and qualities that make it a prime candidate as an etiological agent for ulcerative colitis. Hydrogen peroxide is highly pleiotropic, which means it has many different effects that explains the puzzling clinical behavior of this illness. No other molecule in the human body has all these molecular features. Some of the unique effects and characteristics of hydrogen peroxide that contribute to causing ulcerative colitis are chemotactic for neutrophils. This means that hydrogen peroxide can attract white blood cells called neutrophils into the colonic epithelium, leading to ulcerative colitis. Very few molecules are chemotactic for neutrophils. Number two, cell membrane permeability. Hydrogen peroxide is highly cell membrane permeable. This means that hydrogen peroxide produced inside the colonic epithelial cells can leak out through the cell membrane, causing ulcerative colitis. Number three, hydrogen peroxide requires glutathione for elimination. Glutathione is responsible for the majority of hydrogen peroxide removal in the cell. However, there is an order of magnitude interpersonal variation in glutathione serum concentration. This means that some people will have up to 10 times more glutathione than others, with those on the lower end having a greater risk of developing ulcerative colitis. Glutathione production is under nuclear genetic control and provides the basis for the genetic predisposition for the initial development of ulcerative colitis. However, as we shall explain in a subsequent slide, relapse is mainly under mitochondrial genetic control. Thus, both nuclear and mitochondrial genomes contribute to the natural history of ulcerative colitis. We can use this information to therapeutically alter the natural history of this disease. Number four, produced by the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain produces most of the hydrogen peroxide in the body. And any condition that increases the activity of the electron transport chain will increase hydrogen peroxide production and the risk of developing ulcerative colitis. Electron transport chain activity increases during hypermetabolic states. This explains the increased risk of ulcerative colitis long after smoking cessation. Number five, capable of oxidizing proteins and DNA. Hydrogen peroxide is a powerful oxidizing agent capable of oxidizing and disintegrating intercellular tight junctional proteins, which are the cement that holds the cells together. This causes the increased paracellular permeability or leaky gut observed in ulcerative colitis. Hydrogen peroxide can also oxidize and introduce mutations into DNA, 
which is the molecular basis of relapse and colon cancer observed in ulcerative colitis. Number six, production of hydrogen peroxide can exceed the antioxidant capacity of the cell. The metabolic production of hydrogen peroxide can acutely increase several fold, which can overwhelm the cell's antioxidant ability to neutralize the excess hydrogen peroxide. This can cause hydrogen peroxide to build up in the cell and eventually leak out causing ulcerative colitis. And number seven, produced by many metabolic reactions in the cell. This is the reason why there are so many environmental factors that can exacerbate ulcerative colitis. Each environmental factor can increase the activity of one or more of the metabolic reactions that generate hydrogen peroxide. Environmental factors that increase hydrogen peroxide are called oxidative stressors. Life itself is an oxidative stressor. In summary, Hydrogen peroxide is a prime candidate to fill the role as the causal agent in ulcerative colitis because it has all the molecular features and characteristics that are necessary to initiate the type of colonic inflammation that is characteristic of this disease. In the next slide, I will present the clinical and experimental evidence supporting hydrogen peroxide as the cause of ulcerative colitis. Before we get to the reason why hydrogen peroxide is high in the colon of individuals with ulcerative colitis, we first need to know if hydrogen peroxide can really cause ulcerative colitis. To figure this out, we can look at a few seminal studies, of course, with the benefit of 21st century hindsight. In 1960, a case report of human ulcerative colitis caused by a hydrogen peroxide enema was followed up by a study in which mice receiving hydrogen peroxide enemas developed colitis that was histologically indistinguishable from human ulcerative colitis. This would have raised suspicion that hydrogen peroxide could be involved in the development of human ulcerative colitis because hydrogen peroxide is produced by all cells of the body, including colonic epithelial cells, and hydrogen peroxide is cell membrane permeable. So, if hydrogen peroxide is produced in excess, it could exit the colonic epithelial cells and mimic the effect of hydrogen peroxide enemas in humans, which causes ulcerative colitis. This is certainly intriguing, but we need more evidence. The next bit of evidence needed is to find out if colonic epithelial cells can produce enough hydrogen peroxide to cause ulcerative colitis? The answer came in 2001 by way of a study with mice that were genetically modified so as to be unable to neutralize intracellular colonic hydrogen peroxide. This caused the hydrogen peroxide to build up inside their colonic epithelial cells, which eventually caused a superficial neutrophilic mucosal colitis with mucin depletion, crypt abscesses, and crypt distortion analogous to human ulcerative colitis. This colitis was specific for hydrogen peroxide and was not observed in mice genetically incapable of eliminating superoxide, which is another oxygen radical. This is not surprising since hydrogen peroxide, but not superoxide, is chemotactic for neutrophils. So now we know that hydrogen peroxide enemas can cause ulcerative colitis in humans and animals. And additionally, colonic epithelial cells can generate sufficient hydrogen peroxide during normal metabolism to cause ulcerative colitis. The next piece of the puzzle is to find out if humans with ulcerative colitis have high levels of hydrogen peroxide within their colonic epithelial cells. This is a pivotal study because if hydrogen peroxide is normal in people with ulcerative colitis, then we must reject hydrogen peroxide as the cause of ulcerative colitis. The answer to this question 
was demonstrated in 2007 with a study that measured hydrogen peroxide in the ascending non-inflamed region of the colon in people with ulcerative colitis, which found significantly elevated levels of hydrogen peroxide production in the colonic epithelium. The absence of inflammation excludes neutrophils as the source of hydrogen peroxide and demonstrates that the buildup of hydrogen peroxide occurred prior to the appearance of inflammation which satisfies the absolute requirement for the cause, which is hydrogen peroxide, to be present before the effect, which is the inflammation. The authors of the study concluded that based on the data, it is possible to attribute the pathogenesis of ulcerative colitis to excess hydrogen peroxide. This is a logical conclusion based on the experimental evidence. Finally, if colonic hydrogen peroxide is truly the cause of human ulcerative colitis, then we should see dramatic improvement with a therapeutic intervention that eliminates excess colonic hydrogen peroxide. This was observed in a case series report of 36 patients with refractory ulcerative colitis in which 85% achieved complete histologic remission after several weeks of treatment. Although no long-term follow-up was planned, one patient in this case series with a 39-year history of refractory ulcerative colitis allowed publication of his 2019 colonoscopy and biopsy results, which were completely normal 12 years after receiving the novel therapy in 2007. To date, the patient continues asymptomatic. This was published as a case report. Thus, we have come full circle demonstrating that hydrogen peroxide enemas can cause human ulcerative colitis in addition to reproducing all the histological features of human ulcerative colitis in mice receiving hydrogen peroxide enemas, and finally showing elevated hydrogen peroxide in the non-inflamed colonic epithelium of people with ulcerative colitis in addition to reversing all signs of ulcerative colitis with treatment designed to eliminate excess colonic hydrogen peroxide. These data provide compelling evidence that colonic epithelial hydrogen peroxide is the etiological agent responsible for human ulcerative colitis and treatment with a reducing agent aimed at eliminating excess colonic hydrogen peroxide can induce complete histological remission and mediate biological alterations in colonic epithelial cells that can abrogate the tendency for relapse. By all measures, this represents a cure for this disease. We shall examine the mechanism by which this can occur and specific therapeutic options employed in the subsequent slide. Finally, it's appropriate to mention that despite consensus opinions by leading researchers to the contrary, ongoing research since the 1950s has failed to uncover any evidence for a pre-existing immune dysfunction as the cause of ulcerative colitis. The evidence strongly indicates that the immune system is normal in people with ulcerative colitis and is simply doing what it's programmed to do given the exposure it is subjected to, which is the chemotactic effect of hydrogen peroxide diffusing from colonic epithelial cells. This is highly relevant for everyone with ulcerative colitis because, as we shall see, long-term inhibition of the immune system with immunosuppressive or immunomodulating agents or any agent directed at the immune response can cause the cellular level of hydrogen peroxide to increase. This can cause the underlying disease process to worsen, leading to medically refractory disease or colon cancer resulting in a total colectomy. More about this during the concluding comments at the end of this video. In the next slide, we define the effect of environmental factors whose exposure increases the risk for developing ulcerative colitis.
Most of us have heard that environmental factors can affect ulcerative colitis. But what are environmental factors and how do they affect ulcerative colitis? In simple terms, an environmental factor is anything that worsens ulcerative colitis or causes relapse. These same environmental factors also cause people to develop ulcerative colitis to begin with. Environmental factors are very varied and can be things like stress, diet, drugs, infections, or lifestyle choices. But how do environmental factors cause relapse? Well, since we already know that hydrogen peroxide has a causal role in the development of ulcerative colitis, it follows that environmental factors are exposures that increase cellular hydrogen peroxide. And since hydrogen peroxide is an oxidant, we can define environmental factors that exacerbate ulcerative colitis as oxidative stressors whose mechanism is to increase cellular hydrogen peroxide. In other words, all environmental factors that worsen ulcerative colitis are oxidative stressors that increase cellular hydrogen peroxide. Oxidative stressors can be different for different people, and the same oxidative stressor may be less of a problem for one person compared to another. When oxidative stressors are outside the body, they are called external oxidative stressors. All the oxidative stressors depicted here, such as stress, diet, drugs, infection, and lifestyle choices are external oxidative stressors. However, other oxidative stressors, such as certain metabolites and metabolic reactions that generate hydrogen peroxide are internal or inside the body and are called internal oxidative stressors. In summary, why people develop ulcerative colitis is no mystery. You are simply being exposed to oxidative stressors that cause your body to produce more hydrogen peroxide than you can handle. This is important to know because part of the treatment is minimizing exposure to oxidative stress. There is more detailed information regarding oxidative stress and their mechanisms in the references listed in the comments section. In the next slide, we will define the genetic predisposition that increases the risk of developing ulcerative colitis in the first place. What is genetic predisposition in ulcerative colitis? In other words, what does it mean to have a genetic predisposition to develop ulcerative colitis? In simple terms, genetic predisposition refers to genes that increase the risk of developing ulcerative colitis. To explain this a little further, we'll start at the cellular level. The dots in the diagram represent the cells that make up the body, and there are trillions of cells in the body. To find the genetic predisposition, we need to expand one of these cells. Inside every cell in the body is a structure called the nucleus, which is highlighted by the red circle. The nucleus contains the chromosomes. The chromosomes in turn are made up of long molecules called DNA. Each DNA molecule contains many genes. The genes provide the instructions to make all the proteins in the body. The job of some of these proteins is to remove hydrogen peroxide from the cell. All of these hydrogen peroxide removing proteins work together as antioxidants to remove hydrogen peroxide from the body. And when there's not enough of these hydrogen peroxide removing proteins or they are not working well enough, the hydrogen peroxide can build up in the colonic epithelial cells leading to ulcerative colitis. The main hydrogen peroxide removing proteins are called glutathione and glutathione peroxidase, but there are other proteins that are part of the body's antioxidant defense against the buildup of hydrogen peroxide. Thus, the data indicate that the genetic predisposition leading to ulcerative colitis is insufficient antioxidant capacity to cope with a large sudden increase in cellular hydrogen peroxide, 
causing the hydrogen peroxide to build up in colonic epithelial cells leading to ulcerative colitis. In the next slide, we will discuss what the evidence indicates is the cause of relapse. It's critical to understand the mechanism of relapse because if we can fix the problem leading to relapse, we can cure this disease. What does the evidence indicate is the cause of relapse in ulcerative colitis? To understand this, we need to look at a single colonic epithelial cell, which is shown in the illustration. Recall that these are the cells that line the inner surface of the colon. Colonic epithelial cells contain many small structures called mitochondria, which is highlighted by the red square. Mitochondria are very susceptible to oxidative damage by hydrogen peroxide. So, after ulcerative colitis develops, the excess hydrogen peroxide inside colonic epithelial cells can enter mitochondria, causing damage to the mitochondrial DNA. This causes mitochondria to continuously produce large amounts of hydrogen peroxide, which is depicted by the letters H2O2 in the illustration. The excess hydrogen peroxide produced by mitochondria flood the colonic epithelial cells, causing relapse when medication is withdrawn. Thus, the data indicate that relapse in ulcerative colitis is caused by hydrogen peroxide-induced oxidative damage to mitochondrial DNA, which introduces mutations into the protein subunits of the electron transport chain. This increases electron leakage, resulting in increased hydrogen peroxide production and relapse. A more detailed explanation of the mechanism involved can be found in the references listed in the comments section. To understand how the treatment works, we first need to know where the treatment works. To that end, this is an image from a previous slide showing the colon on the left with a magnified piece of the colonic epithelium on the right. The colonic epithelium covers the entire inner surface of the colon. The colonic epithelium is highlighted by the red square. This image is a high-powered view of the colonic epithelium we just saw in the previous slide. The colonic epithelium is made up of cells that are stacked on top of one another around a central hollow tube called the Crypt of Lieberkuhn after the 18th century German scientist who first identified them. I have highlighted one of the crypts with the black rectangle. There are millions of these crypts in the colon. To the right are actual microscopic photographs of normal colonic crypts. The red arrows point to the crypt, which under normal circumstances are clear and free of any debris. On the bottom right is the same view, but from a person with active ulcerative colitis. In this case, the crypts are not clear, but filled with many white blood cells called neutrophils, causing inflammation and forming crypt abscesses, which are indicated by the black arrows. The neutrophils in the crypts produce large amounts of hydrogen peroxide, which disintegrates the glue holding the cells together, causing them to become distorted as seen in this photograph. This is what active ulcerative colitis looks like under the microscope. Hydrogen peroxide can also damage blood vessels in the colon, causing the bloody diarrhea often seen in ulcerative colitis. The current dogma is that people with ulcerative colitis suddenly develop some form of immune dysfunction that causes these neutrophils to suddenly stream into the colon. This was interpreted as the immune system attacking the colon, despite ongoing research since the 1950s having failed to identify any antecedent immune abnormality in patients with ulcerative colitis. However, the evidence indicates that people with ulcerative colitis have normal immune systems whose neutrophils are being attracted into the colon by the hydrogen peroxide that is inappropriately secreted by the colonic epithelium. Lastly, take note 
that the blood vessels containing the neutrophils are just below the crypts, while the stool containing very high concentrations of bacteria is just above on the inner surface of the colon. This close relationship is important for development of ulcerative colitis, as we shall see in the next slide, when we zoom in on a single crypt and discuss the evidence-based treatment of ulcerative colitis. With the available data, we can now predict the correct way of treating ulcerative colitis. We can also understand why all current medications fail to adequately treat or cure this disease. In the picture, we can see a single crypt of Lieberkuhn. The little black dots represent the hydrogen peroxide being secreted from the colonic epithelial cells. It is this hydrogen peroxide that is attracting neutrophils from the blood vessels just below. The neutrophils represent the immune system's response that causes colonic inflammation in ulcerative colitis. Hydrogen peroxide disintegrates the proteins holding the colonic epithelial cells together, causing the cells to fall apart. This allows stool bacteria to invade the epithelial lining of the colon, causing additional inflammation. If you treat ulcerative colitis with any agent that blocks any aspect of the immune response, this does nothing to eliminate the hydrogen peroxide emanating from colonic epithelial cells, which is the reason why neutrophils are streaming into the colonic epithelium to begin with. Since the hydrogen peroxide is still present, the neutrophils that cause the inflammation will return as soon as the medication is withdrawn, causing relapse. While taking any agent that blocks the immune response, the high amounts of colonic epithelial intracellular hydrogen peroxide continues to damage mitochondrial DNA within colonic epithelial cells, which leads to higher levels of hydrogen peroxide production. This vicious cycle continues to generate additional intracellular hydrogen peroxide while taking medications that block the immune response. A detailed description of the mechanism can be found in the references listed in the comment section. Thus, agents that block the immune response may temporarily improve the inflammation, but they can also cause the underlying disease process to worsen. This can lead to a false sense of security, which culminates in refractory disease requiring a colectomy. This is why all current medications for ulcerative colitis have failed to adequately treat this disease. For this reason, no agent directed at the immune response can adequately treat ulcerative colitis or cure this disease. Based on the data, the only way of restoring full and normal functionality to the colon and preventing relapse is to eliminate the excess hydrogen peroxide which is the chemical signal that is attracting neutrophils into the colonic epithelium and causing inflammation and ulcerative colitis. The evidence indicates that elimination of excess hydrogen peroxide can be accomplished with R-dihydrolipoic acid, which is abbreviated with the letters RDLA. As you can see in the table to the right, RDLA can scavenge or neutralize hydrogen peroxide and several other damaging radical species that may be present. The reference where this table can be found is listed in the comments section. Lipoic acid listed in the center column is converted to the reduced dihydro form in the body, and this conversion can worsen ulcerative colitis, so it should not be used. The R form of dihydrolipoic acid is the preferred biologically active form. RDLA is taken orally and is absorbed into the bloodstream. From there, it is secreted from the capillaries into the extracellular space, where it eliminates extracellular hydrogen peroxide. Without hydrogen peroxide to attract neutrophils into the colonic epithelium, there is no further inflammation. Since neutrophils only live for a few hours to a couple of days, the colitis will slowly resolve within several days. This has been called induction of remission. 
Additionally, since RDLA is membrane permeable, it can enter colonic epithelial cells and neutralize excess hydrogen peroxide inside the cells. Neutralizing excess intracellular hydrogen peroxide will prevent any further inflammation since there is no intracellular hydrogen peroxide that can diffuse out of the colonic epithelial cells to attract neutrophils into the colonic epithelium and cause relapse. This has been called maintenance of remission. Thus, the ability of RDLA to neutralize hydrogen peroxide will resolve the colonic inflammation. However, once RDLA is inside colonic epithelial cells, it can diffuse inside mitochondria, which are the source of the excess hydrogen peroxide. Clinical data indicate that RDLA can repair mitochondrial DNA damage caused by hydrogen peroxide. The evidence for this are studies, such as the one cited on the screen, showing that increasing cellular glutathione can repair mitochondrial DNA that has been oxidized and damaged. Since RDLA increases cellular glutathione, I would expect that RDLA can repair mitochondrial DNA damage caused by hydrogen peroxide and in the process, lower mitochondrial hydrogen peroxide generation back to normal levels. Based on the evidence, this represents a cure for ulcerative colitis. This explains how an individual with unresponsive ulcerative colitis for nearly 40 years has remained asymptomatic with normal colonic biopsies after receiving the treatment in 2007. This extraordinary response was reported in the case report you are now seeing on the screen. Finally, this is the first time a plausible and falsifiable biological mechanism has been proposed to explain the pathogenesis of ulcerative colitis in addition to the process leading to relapse in this disease. The recognition of a plausible mitochondrial contribution to relapse is a first real step towards curing everyone with ulcerative colitis. This is a logical conclusion based on the scientific evidence and clinical response to the treatment. The next slide provides a step-by-step -step overview of how ulcerative colitis begins and the mechanism that explains the cause of relapse. Before we finish, I thought I would present a brief overview of the overall mechanism that the evidence indicates is the cause of ulcerative colitis and relapse. According to the evidence, this is all you need to know in order to get a good understanding of what causes ulcerative colitis and relapse, which is the medical term for the flares commonly seen with this disease. I've labeled the important microscopic structures that make up the colonic epithelium with the letters A to F and the steps involved in the process leading to the development of ulcerative colitis with the numbers one to six. We'll touch on each of these briefly. The image that you see on the left shows a single microscopic crypt that is made up of colonic epithelial cells, which are highlighted by the red circle and labeled with the letter A in the upper left corner of the image. These are the cells that cover the inner surface of the colon. Together, these cells make up the colonic epithelium. There are millions of these crypts covering the inner surface of the colon. Next, we have the crypt itself, which is the space surrounded by the colonic epithelial cells. At the top, we have the stool, which is on the inner surface of the colon. The stool has a very high concentration of bacteria, which are the small green rods indicated by the arrow. Next, we have the extracellular space, which is all the space surrounding the colonic epithelial cells outside of the crypt. The space inside the crypt and the extracellular space outside the crypt are very important because that's where hydrogen peroxide will leak into when diffusing out from colonic epithelial cells. Towards the bottom, I've highlighted the blood vessels that contain the neutrophils. 
The blood vessels are very important because that's where the neutrophils come from, which enter the colonic epithelium to cause inflammation and ulcerative colitis. The initial step indicated by number one is the exposure to oxidative stress resulting in the buildup and eventual diffusion or leakage of hydrogen peroxide from colonic epithelial cells into the crypt and the space outside the crypt, which we'll call the extracellular space. Hydrogen peroxide is depicted by the small black dots and is abbreviated H2O2. In step two, leakage of hydrogen peroxide from colonic epithelial cells attracts neutrophils, which begin to leave the blood vessels. At the same time, hydrogen peroxide begins to disintegrate intercellular tight junctions, which is the protein glue holding the colonic epithelial cells together. This causes an increase in paracellular permeability or leaky gut characteristic of ulcerative colitis. In step three, neutrophils migrate towards the source of the hydrogen peroxide within the crypts, while bacteria shown here as green rods begin to penetrate the normally sterile extracellular space beneath the crypts. In step four, neutrophils are exposed to bacteria in the crypt and in response produce large amounts of hydrogen peroxide. Step five shows how the large amount of hydrogen peroxide produced by the many neutrophils in the crypt penetrates the colonic epithelial cells, causing oxidative damage to mitochondrial DNA. This type of genetic mitochondrial damage causes mitochondria to produce much more hydrogen peroxide than normal, which can flood the colonic epithelial cells and leak to the extracellular space, causing relapse, which is shown in step six. It is important to note that all cells in the body produce hydrogen peroxide, but only cells of the immune system, such as neutrophils, produce hydrogen peroxide for use outside the cell to kill bacteria and to attract other neutrophils to help out with fighting an infection. Colonic epithelial cells do not normally secrete hydrogen peroxide. This only happens when too much hydrogen peroxide is being produced and some leaks out of the colonic epithelial cells. Neutrophils cannot distinguish where the hydrogen peroxide is coming from. They are simply programmed to move towards the source of the hydrogen peroxide. Normally, the source is another neutrophil fighting an infection. But if the source happens to be a colonic epithelial cell inappropriately secreting hydrogen peroxide, neutrophils will migrate towards the colonic epithelium, causing inflammation and ulcerative colitis. In other words, there is nothing wrong with the immune system in people with ulcerative colitis. Neutrophils are simply doing what they are programmed to do when exposed to extracellular hydrogen peroxide. That's why long-term suppression of the immune response with immunosuppressive agents or biologics can never cure ulcerative colitis and is detrimental since the production of hydrogen peroxide in colonic epithelial cells continues to increase while taking these drugs. This can lead to medically refractory ulcerative colitis resulting in a total colectomy. Excess hydrogen peroxide in colonic epithelial cells can eventually penetrate the nucleus, causing genetic damage that can result in colon cancer. One aspect of the pathogenesis that requires additional explanation is step number five, which indicates that mitochondria that are exposed to hydrogen peroxide will generate more hydrogen peroxide on their own. But why does this happen? It's important to answer this question because it is the reason indicated by the evidence that people with ulcerative colitis have lifelong episodes of relapse. It is also the reason why a reducing agent such as R-dihydrolipoic acid can abrogate the tendency for relapse and cure this disease. To understand this, we need to take a look 
inside the mitochondrion. On the right side of the screen is an expanded view of the mitochondrion to show what happens when too much hydrogen peroxide builds up inside. In ulcerative colitis, hydrogen peroxide can originate from outside the colonic epithelial cell, which would be an extracellular source as indicated by the pink oval on the screen. An example of an extracellular source of hydrogen peroxide are the neutrophils that accumulate in the colonic epithelium in ulcerative colitis or other enteric infections. Hydrogen peroxide can also originate from inside the colonic epithelial cell as a byproduct of certain metabolic reactions. Excess hydrogen peroxide can also originate from inside mitochondria. This occurs when the electron transport chain becomes hyperactive. In all cases, if excess hydrogen peroxide reaches inside of mitochondria, it can cause oxidative damage to mitochondrial DNA, as depicted by the pink oval in the diagram. This causes mutations to be introduced into the mitochondrial genome. So when the mitochondrial genes are turned on, they produce defective electron transport chain protein subunits, as shown in the pink oval on the screen. These defective subunits are incorporated into the electron transport chain, but since they are defective, they cause the electron transport chain to be dysfunctional, as indicated by the pink oval. The defective electron transport chain causes more electrons to leak out from the chain, which results in additional hydrogen peroxide being produced. This is depicted by the pink oval on the diagram. This process leads to a vicious cycle within colonic epithelial cells and generates ever higher amounts of hydrogen peroxide, which leads to relapse when medication is withdrawn. The evidence indicates that the reducing agent R-dihydrolipoic acid can repair oxidatively damaged mitochondrial DNA and terminate the vicious cycle of ever-increasing hydrogen peroxide production that leads to relapse. Based on the evidence, this represents a cure for ulcerative colitis. Before we wrap up with a summary of ulcerative colitis in the next slide, we still have one more question to answer, which is, can hydrogen peroxide leaking out of the colonic epithelial cells diffuse the distance between the crypt of Lieberkuhn and the blood vessels just below? This is critical because hydrogen peroxide would need to reach the blood vessels in order to attract the neutrophils that are circulating in the bloodstream. The image in the slide shows the colonic epithelium. The minimum distance that hydrogen peroxide would need to diffuse is indicated by the green arrow, which is the distance between the bottom portion of the crypt of Lieberkuhn and the surface of the blood vessel. This distance is approximately 50 micrometers or 50 millionths of a meter. For comparison, the length of the entire crypt of Lieberkuhn is approximately 200 micrometers or about one fifth of a millimeter. I have also superimposed the width of a single human hair, which is about 50 micrometers in width, so you can get an idea of the distances involved. Studies have demonstrated that hydrogen peroxide can diffuse more than a hundred micrometers in tissue, indicating that hydrogen peroxide has more than enough diffusing potential to reach the blood vessels and attract neutrophils into the colonic epithelium, leading to inflammation and ulcerative colitis. In the next slide, we put it all together with an overview of the entire pathogenesis and treatment goals. In this slide, we summarize all the data presented in this video. The question we want to answer is why a person who never had colitis suddenly develops inflammation of the colon leading to ulcerative colitis. We can visualize this by creating a chronological time lapse of the events leading up to the development of this condition. We can then infer the rational basis for effective treatment and how to effectuate a cure. 
Ulcerative colitis begins before any inflammation is evident, when the individual is exposed to environmental oxidative stressors. As previously mentioned, oxidative stressors are exposures that cause the body to generate hydrogen peroxide. Although extremely varied, all oxidative stressors have one thing in common, which is that they all generate hydrogen peroxide in the body. Examples of oxidative stressors are stress, diet, especially high fat, low fiber diets, drugs, infections, and lifestyle. The mechanisms by which oxidative stressors generate excess hydrogen peroxide are explained in the references posted in the comments section. Oxidative stressors are additive because they all generate hydrogen peroxide, and there is usually more than one oxidative stressor causing oxidative stress at any given time. The extensive variation among the different oxidative stressors is due to the dozens of metabolic pathways that generate hydrogen peroxide in the cell. Metabolic pathways that generate hydrogen peroxide can be modulated by environmental factors, which is why these environmental factors are called oxidative stressors. Ulcerative colitis begins with oxidative stress exposure as shown in step A of the diagram. Oxidative stressors can be external to the body, such as stress and diet, as shown in the picture, or internal to the body and caused by a metabolite, such as homocysteine. We are all exposed to oxidative stress, but only individuals with a specific genetic predisposition that limits their ability to neutralize a hydrogen peroxide cellular oxidant load will begin to accumulate hydrogen peroxide within rectal epithelial cells. This is depicted in steps B and C of the diagram. For reasons associated with a limited metabolism, rectal epithelial cells have a diminished reductive or antioxidant capacity compared to more proximal regions of the GI tract. This results in the rectum being the first place where hydrogen peroxide will accumulate. Once hydrogen peroxide builds up within rectal epithelial cells, it can diffuse through the cell membrane to the extracellular space and begin to attract neutrophils into the rectal epithelium, as shown in step D. This leads to mucosal inflammation and eventual ulcerative colitis, as shown in steps E and F. Once in contact with bacteria in the lumen, neutrophils in the rectal epithelium become activated to secrete large amounts of hydrogen peroxide, which attracts additional neutrophils into the colonic epithelium. This is depicted in step G of the diagram. The continuous secretion of hydrogen peroxide by neutrophils in the colonic epithelium makes the inflammation self-perpetuating and auto-stimulating because the surrounding colonic epithelial cells have a compromised antioxidant capacity due to previous oxidative stress exposure. This causes all the hydrogen peroxide produced by neutrophils to diffuse into the surrounding extracellular space, which attracts additional neutrophils into the colonic epithelium. This gives the appearance of an autoimmune condition in which neutrophils of the innate immune system are attacking the colon when they are simply responding to the chemotactic signal of hydrogen peroxide in the extracellular space. In other words, as long as activated neutrophils are present in the colonic epithelium secreting hydrogen peroxide, the inflammation will continue on its own. However, it is possible to eliminate the influx of neutrophils with anti-inflammatory immunosuppressant agents such as corticosteroids or biologics. So why does the inflammation always return? The problem is that hydrogen peroxide secreted by neutrophils in the crypt of Libracoon 
also back diffuses into the colonic epithelial cells, causing oxidative damage to mitochondrial DNA, which is depicted in step H and I of the diagram. The red letters MGD stands for mitochondrial genetic damage. This causes colonic epithelial cells to produce ever-increasing amounts of hydrogen peroxide over time, which causes relapse after medication is withdrawn. The mechanism is detailed in the references listed in the comments section below. Based on this diagram, we can now deduce that elimination of extracellular hydrogen peroxide will completely resolve the colitis, since the absence of hydrogen peroxide in the extracellular space will preclude neutrophil chemotaxis and further inflammation. This has been called induction of remission. However, to prevent relapse, we need to eliminate excess hydrogen peroxide within colonic epithelial cells in step C. This has been called maintenance of remission. Finally, to effectuate a cure, we need to correct the mitochondrial genetic damage that is responsible for relapse. And according to the evidence, when this is accomplished, ulcerative colitis is cured because colonic epithelial cells will no longer generate excess hydrogen peroxide that can attract neutrophils into the colonic epithelium to cause inflammation and relapse of ulcerative colitis. This means that the colonic epithelium has returned to the state it was prior to developing ulcerative colitis. As mentioned in a previous slide, all three interventions can be accomplished by using an amphipathic reducing agent such as R-dihydrolipoic acid. In this case, the terms induction and maintenance of remission are no longer needed since resolution of inflammation in addition to indefinite absence of inflammation and normal colonic functionality can be attained by the same therapeutic agent. You can also see that any treatment that does not eliminate the excess colonic hydrogen peroxide cannot effectively treat or cure this disease. In other words, individuals with ulcerative colitis have a deficiency of electrons needed for the redux elimination of hydrogen peroxide. The oral reducing agent supplies the electrons needed to neutralize the excess hydrogen peroxide. This is analogous to supplying the appropriate micronutrient in a person with a vitamin deficiency, but instead of vitamins, we are supplying electrons. From a clinical perspective, the treatment of ulcerative colitis falls under redux medicine. However, it could equally be classified as quantum medicine, since we are dealing with electrons, which are quantum particles. This explains why it has taken so long to recognize a causal role for hydrogen peroxide in ulcerative colitis. Finally, it's important to note that other tissues in the body may have comparable reductive capacity to the rectum, but the unique microanatomy of the rectal epithelium that allows the accumulation of hydrogen peroxide within the crypts of Lieberkuhn which permits contact between the luminal bacterial antigens and the innate immune system is unique in the body and leads to mucosal inflammation and ulcerative colitis. In the next and last slide, we conclude this video with some final commentary. In conclusion, the data indicate that colonic epithelial cell hydrogen peroxide has a causal role in the pathogenesis of ulcerative colitis. Hydrogen peroxide production can be modulated by the same environmental exposures that are known risk factors for ulcerative colitis. Hydrogen peroxide is highly membrane permeable and a potent neutrophilic chemotactic agent. This allows hydrogen peroxide to diffuse through the colonic epithelial cell membrane to the extracellular space and attract neutrophils into the colonic epithelium, causing ulcerative colitis. 
Number two, relapse is caused by hydrogen peroxide induced oxidation of mitochondrial DNA. This introduces mutations into the mitochondrial DNA that miscodes during transcription, causing mutations to appear in the protein subunits of the electron transport chain. This causes increased electron leakage from the electron transport chain and increased production of hydrogen peroxide in colonic epithelial cells. The increased hydrogen peroxide production in turn leads to additional mitochondrial genetic oxidative damage, setting up a positive feedback loop or vicious cycle of ever increasing colonic epithelial hydrogen peroxide production, which leads to relapse upon discontinuation of medication. And number three, R-dihydrolipoic acid is an oral reducing agent that can neutralize hydrogen peroxide and resolve colonic inflammation while indefinitely restoring normal colonic functionality by providing needed reducing equivalents to colonic epithelial cells our dihydrolipoic acid is able to regenerate the reduced forms of all other cellular antioxidant agents including cellular glutathione studies have shown that increasing mitochondrial glutathione can repair mitochondrial genetic damage since our dihydrolipoic acid can increase cellular glutathione that can repair mitochondrial genetic damage, which the data supports as responsible for relapse, this indicates that repairing mitochondrial genetic damage will abrogate the tendency for relapse and effectuate a cure for ulcerative colitis. This explains how the individual described in the case report on the screen who had a 39-year history of refractory ulcerative colitis and rectal bleeding has remained asymptomatic with normal colonic biopsies for 15 years to date after being treated in 2007. Continued research on this exciting new therapeutic approach to treating ulcerative colitis will advance our understanding of ulcerative colitis and hopefully cure everyone with this disease. This is the last slide. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new about the cause and how to treat and cure ulcerative colitis. Everything presented in this video is evidence-based, which means that all the conclusions follow logically from the evidence. I have been researching the pathogenesis, treatment, and cure of ulcerative colitis since the year 2000. Along the way, I have learned that the most important thing that a researcher can do is follow the evidence. The cause of disease and their cures can only be found if we follow the evidence. It doesn't mean that you'll be successful every time because there may not be enough evidence or your interpretation of the evidence is incorrect. However, if we don't follow the evidence, there is no hope of finding cures for any disease. The converse is also true. If we spend decades doing research on the same subject, such as immune dysfunction to explain inflammatory bowel disease, and we do not find the cause and the cure, it is likely that we are not following the evidence and we must change our focus if we are ever to find cures for these diseases. I hope you understood the video. Please post any questions in the comments section below and thank you for listening.